It's the Dearly Departed Podcast, featuring your host, historian Scott Michaels, and filmmaker Mike Dorsey. It's the Dearly Departed Podcast, and I am Mike Dorsey. And I am Scott Michaels. Hi. And today uh, we're doing uh, a film that is certainly, I think, close to your heart, Scott. Uh, Todd Browning's Freaks from 1932. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's it's um, <laughs> I think I saw this the first time in the early 80s. It was, uh, you know, cause it was so scandalous. And uh, and I fell in right. love, fell in love with this movie because it's just so bizarre. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm thrilled, thrilled. Yes, and uh, several people have recommended that we um, that we do this one and are excited that we're doing it finally. So uh, I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, before we get into that, I wanted to get into uh, new- news since we did our last show. News of the week. <laughs> First of all, you can um, you can buy the crypt. That is next to Marilyn Monroe right now. The well, the one is kind of between her and Hugh Hefner, I guess. No, I think it's I think it's below her. Is yeah. it below her? Okay. Yeah. Um, and it is being auctioned off. Starting bid is supposed to be two million dollars. Yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> when Hugh Hefner bought next to Marilyn, uh, he did that like in the nineties, I think, and uh, or even eighties, uh, you know. And I was doing some research on that just this week about that the paper the newspaper articles are, are vague because they're saying it's like two spaces over but there's oh it's her and hugh in a wall there's no nothing you know neck mm-hmm. between them but i believe it was jerry herman the playwright uh the the musician um the composer playwright and and he had it below her but i think it was two spaces below her so yeah but that's the, the woman above remember a couple of years ago she was trying to sell it uh poncher because he's the one that was supposed to be flipped <laughs> upside down and facing on top of maryland that oh, did, that did really happen yeah. they really did do that but uh but oh. she was asking for some extortionate amount of money but i don't think that ever showed up so who knows what's going to happen but jerry herman is buried in new york so he's not using it yeah, he bought it. Um, he's, I think, most famous he, for writing, uh, I believe, the score, or composing the score for Hello, Dolly, one of his, mm-hmm. his bigger musicals. Um, but mm-hmm. he had bought it uh, for 75000 back in 1997 because he uh, tested, he was HIV positive. Mm-hmm. And he, I believe he was living in L.A. at the time. So he, he bought it and then he ended up living to a ripe old age. I think he lived to be like 88. And, you know, by then... You know, his life had changed or whatever, so he decided not to use it. He was buried on the East Coast. So, um, wild. Bought it for 75 grand, you know, 25 years ago, 24 years ago, and now it's $2 million. And he's not able to enjoy it. And he can't enjoy it, exactly. I wonder who is, he probably had a boyfriend or a husband or something at that point, I would imagine, who's got whoever the heir yeah. was. Yeah, and maybe they'll be buried together or something back back East. Um, they yeah. uh, uh, A typical crypt like this in that, Cemetery. If it was anywhere else, this is Pierce Brothers Westwood Village. Uh, typically, would go for about 180 grand. Um, so a huge markup for it being, you know, next to Marilyn. For sure, for sure. Yeah, because this, yeah, the cemetery would sell it at that at that fee, uh, the fair price. But yeah, if you go off mm-hmm. off off the estate, yeah, or off of the um, sta- private sale, then you get, you know, you can make all that money. Jeez. Imagine. <laughs> Imagine, imagine spending two million dollars and then her estate decides to move her <laughs> to yeah. like somewhere else. <laughs> but that's what happened to Judy Garland. You know, people people from all over uh-huh. bought graves. I, a friend of mine bought a grave in that cemetery because of Judy, and people were mm-hmm. you know spending a fortune. And then yeah, they took Judy out and all those people, um, you know, who who are dead and are buried near Judy <laughs> are no longer. It's sort of sort of sad, but you know. <laughs> I would have a clause that, like, if she moves, you have to move me <laughs> wherever she yeah. goes. If it meant that much to me, <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um, uh, the Kurt Cobain uh, death house where he where he, he committed suicide and uh, uh, is back uh, just sold again. I guess it's changed hands a couple of times since then. Their Kurt and Courtney's house here in L.A. is for sale right now too. Oh, really? Yeah. Where is and where is that one? That one's up by Hightower. 
You know that that crazy old tower right okay. off of Highland that you have to take the yep. elevator up to. Uh, but yeah, we had a house way up there, and uh, it was. I mean, if you go on YouTube, a lot of people urban explored it. You know, it was empty and it was trash, and maybe there were squatters. But uh, yeah, so you could get in pretty easily up until just a few weeks ago, I think. I uh, I was only aware of his the apartment that he had rented for a time in the Fairfax district. Mm-hmm. There, just uh, near near Fairfax High School in that neighborhood, yeah, yeah. where he he wrote um, part of uh, In Utero, their second album. He wrote there in that this little. It was really just a crash pad. It wasn't anything fancy. Um, yeah, I've heard stories. But, uh, I think there's pictures you know, available of that, and it was pretty. It's pretty trashed. Yeah, and he used to just wander over to uh, to Cantor's all the time, I guess, for to get food. So it was you know just a few mm-hmm. blocks east of there. Um, the uh, the Durst trial has started up. Finally, yeah. <laughs> you know, because um, it, it, it's why does it think why do things take so long? You know, I don't I don't understand that how, you know, like the uh, Hollywood Ripper, the one we covered for that E show, uh, you know, it was yeah. over 20 years that he's finally convicted for that. It's like, what is that? It, he never even had it wasn't like a, an appeal. I mean, this is his first trial over 20 years after the murder. Right. It's just so this Durst thing. I forget it was Susan Berman. It was in the 90s, wasn't it? When she was shot in the head, yeah, um, but they didn't. But remember, they didn't. Um, they didn't really have a case until the Jinx came out, and the Jinx documentary series is the one that kind of captured sort of a confession, you might argue. Yeah. Um, plus, they found right, that yeah. um, they found that he. Plus, they found that letter. Um, you know that well. They had the the letter that showed the same handwriting and the same misspelling of Beverly Hills, and I believe he has now. Uh, uh, admitted that he wrote the letter to the Beverly Hills Police Department that, you know, telling them that there was a body, a cadaver, I think is the word he used, uh, at Berman's house. So he, I think he's admitted that he wrote that, but he's claiming that he found her already mm-hmm. dead. Um, I mean, she did that. Her, her, her father it, was so. big in organized crime. Was it? Oh, for anyone that doesn't know what we're talking about, this is a, this is a murder that happened in Benedict Canyon, uh, where she was shot execution style. And this Durst guy, it's called the Jinx. It's an amazing docu series. He was cooperating completely, and then that one thing he went to the bathroom and said, so "They'll never catch me on Mike." Which is so stupid. <laughs> but uh, I forget what the, the quote was. But anyway, he's finally on trial and yeah and he's you know she was an interesting person they were friends but she was involved with organized crime you know she her, she was documenting or wrote a book about it um about the mafia or she was some, from a yeah she was from kind of a mafia family like her her, yeah. her dad or somebody i believe was involved in it yeah um and and the, the i believe the suspected motive is that she you know his first wife disappeared and was never found and he's the heir to this huge uh, real estate fortune in Manhattan um, that his brother actually operates because uh, Dur- you know Durst is considered he's just always had kind of mental issues, um, so he was not put in charge of the family business. And uh, his wife uh, disappeared and um, has never been found, and of course suspected that he did something. But it's, they've never just like with all these other ones, they were never able to build a case on it. And uh, and so they, I believe they think the motive was that this that Berman who had become a close friend and confidant may have threatened to go public or to go Mm. to the police with what she knew about the wife's disappearance and that maybe that was his motive. So, but that's, you know, that's what the courts are going to figure out now. So hopefully they get to the bottom of it. Yeah. What a kook. I mean, Um, really, but I highly recommend the jinx. If you haven't watched it, it's so good. Okay. So, uh, green blatts, the famous deli on Sunset Boulevard closed down and its future is currently unknown. Um, yeah. Which is a big bummer. I was never a big Greenblatt's person, but what a history it has in this city. Uh, yeah. Going back to the, the 30s, you know, or 20s. Yeah, they were, the Greenblatt's was originally where the Laugh Factory is, one door over. And I forget what year it was that they mm. moved, you know, over to where they are now or where they were now. Sure. But that came out of nowhere. I mean, that was Allison Martino, our mutual friend, uh, who does vintage Los Angeles. She, um, yeah, she just posted, I heard that Green, I've heard that Greenblatt's is closing. And then boom, it was the right. next day. It was, that was the last day. So, yeah, there's it some- was like they notified the workers tomorrow we're closed. That's it. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. It's sad. It really is. I mean, all those businesses, you know, the block where the Viper Room is, is going and with a Range Rover place down at the far end of Beverly Hills, uh, or at the, at the yep. far end of West Hollywood, that's being torn down. That was originally the Cock and Bull where Jim Morrison used to, you know, run out into yep. the street and wave, you this, know, wave uh, carves down. Um, the, the block. The standard sunset is clo- closed down back in January and now people are trying to make sure that that building is protected enough. The standard, really? I didn't hear that. Yeah. Yeah, the standard uh, same thing. They, you know, they they jacked up the lease and it just in right in the middle of the pandemic and they were like, we can't do it. It's already a struggle enough. You know, mm. with with the hotel bookings down. This was back in January. And yeah, so they they closed their doors and the um the standard in downtown LA, which is super famous filming location, uh their rooftop pool and bar area has been in a bunch of stuff. Uh they're also closed right now, but I think that's more temporary like I think they're planning to reopen, but but the sunset one, they're just they're out. So I, you know, mm-hmm. hopefully, you know, whenever you you hope that it's not a precursor to you know, it was just jack their their rent up so they move out so you can tear the place down and sell it for whatever it's worth now, you know. Yeah, With yeah, yeah. It's funny about that so because that well, that used to be like a motor lodge. It was like the Sunset Motor Lodge in the fifties. Uh, <laughs> but across the street from it is that weird the little Cabo Cantina. That little shack is still there. Which right. has a great history to it. I mean, it's the old Source restaurant. I don't know if you saw that documentary, but the Source was a vegetarian restaurant, but yeah. it was a cult. And it was, it's a really good documentary. It <laughs> and it's this roll rickety shack of a building that's still there. All that new building around it, yet that little shack is still there. And the um, the uh, uh, Annie Hall filmed the whole scene there at the yeah. Source. Uh, and that's where he there used to be a dirt lot next door to it. They built over it a few years ago. But that's the dirt lot is where he backs into the cop car when he's trying to leave. And uh, mm-hmm. and you can see what is now this, you know, what became the standard hotel is across the street under a different name mm-hmm. at the time. But you can see it prominently as like the backdrop. So, yeah, freaking. Yeah, I don't know how that place survived. I mean, they have lousy margaritas, at least the ones I had. It was a, it's a cool place. It's, a, <laughs> it's an old L.A. place, which is rare anymore. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, but on the good news, uh, I, I mean, good news, I think, anyways, it's kind of mixed some people, but Tarantino bought the Vista Theater, the famous Vista. Mm-hmm. Uh, he bought that up, and, and, you know, I think some people are concerned, you know, we already have the New Beverly, you know, is he going to just have another New Beverly? I think he said he's planning on just leaving it as, you know, as is. I don't know. So A first run, I think it's a first it's, run house, yeah. That's it what has always g- been, yeah. Yeah, but he's, I don't know if he's going to, I think it's digital. I don't want to know what he's such a purist about stuff like that. So I don't know what, but uh, yeah, it doesn't sound like he's, he's not doing a new, another new Beverly. And even if he was, so right. what, you know, people are going to the movies. At least it's and, not closing down and getting torn yeah. down. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So and agree. they have that, that fantastic, um, little walk of fame out in front of it with all the cult movie stars, you know, I love yeah. that. It's like the, the cast from dark shadows and Mary Warren of Bud court from Harold and Maud, uh, a little, the cast from poltergeist. It was just like an alternate, um, uh, Grumman's Chinese theater, like an alternate Chinese theater. I love it. I love that place. So for that place, that alone, that should be a historic marker uh, on that place. I just love it. Just love it. Um, I wanted to talk about, uh, have you watched the Val Kilmer documentary yet? No, no. I believe it's on, I watched it, I think on Amazon prime. I think it's streaming on Amazon. If you're a subscriber, um, Mm -hmm. it's really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, he has not been able to really speak since he had, you know, throat cancer surgery back in 2014. So he has, you know, kind of a voice box type thing in his throat. Um, so he, um, it, but it's really, really good. And what he ended up having, having done is his son, who sounds very much like him and is an actor, recorded the VO kind of as him. So, you know, Val wrote the, the voiceover out and then had his son read it as him. It's really, and you actually forget that you're not listening to Val Kilmer while you're watching it. Um, I, I thought it was really good. It was very introspective and, um, I thought pretty honest, which is always important. It didn't feel like a fluff piece, you know, mm-hmm. obviously it, portrays him in mostly positive light, but I, I, it's interesting. He, he owns up to a lot of his mistakes in it. And, um, he's a deeper person than what I ever thought he was. You know what I mean? I always thought him as kind of a pretty boy type actor, um, talented. Sure. But you know, uh, but he was very hardcore. He was the youngest at the time, at least the youngest person ever admitted to Juilliard, uh, as an acting student. Interesting. Um, 
Yeah, and, and coincidentally was there with uh, Kelly McGinnis, who ended up, you know, who ended, they both ended up in Top Gun. So I recommend oh, Kelly it. Kelly McGillis, really good. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah. her, don't you, Kelly and McGillis? It's just, I don't. I wish I did. She seems cool. Oh, I thought she was the one that lived in the house, the cool house. I know Kelly. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that's yeah, Kelly right. Lynch. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I know Kelly Sorry, Lynch. sorry. Um, yeah, uh, Val, uh, and it's a good documentary. I really recommend it. Check it out. There, that's I, see, I was like, there's a lot of buzz about that, but I'm like, like you said, I thought he was just a pretty boy actor. He's in the doors. He's been in a couple of movies I like, but not enough to, mm-hmm. I would never buy a biogra- biography about him or anything. So I don't, <laughs> there's a, um, sort of a, a healthy, a healthy, a healthy portion of the documentary is about the door doing the doors movie too. It's really interesting mm-hmm. uh, and how he you know prepared for the role and just listening to, you know, Morrison music nonstop and watching lots of footage of Morrison to try and get his mannerisms down and mm. all that stuff. He I mean, he, he really, you could see he really dove into his part, into the parts he was in. Um, I can also see how he was a bit of a difficult actor too. So to work with, so you can definitely see how he got that reputation. Um, is this something they're doing while he's still here? You know, like when, when they give the lifetime achievement awards to people, you know, it's usually, <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, it sounds like he kind of produced it. So I don't know, man. Maybe, I mean, you know, he almost died from cancer. Maybe he did feel like it's time to do it. And he's, his acting career is sort of over unless he can get his voice back. So and maybe he just felt like he, I think he says kind of near the beginning, he's kept so much stuff from his, from his career. I mean, he even has all his old auditions cause he used to tape his auditions and, mm-hmm. you know, send them to various directors. He's kept all that stuff. He's got it all in storage. Oh, wow. and I think he kind of felt like I have all these and he's a very creative person. He, he does, he paints and does collages and stuff. And I think he just felt like, what do I do with all this stuff? Like, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of like, let's make a film with it. So that's what he did. So, um, I liked it. I, I thought it was really good. Really well done. Cool. Um, and I also did not know he had a, a brother who um, they they funnily enough, they uh, his brother was wanted to be a director and they used to make little their own little home movies and they um, re, they would recreate stuff. So like they recreated scenes from Jaws together using like, you know, a eight millimeter camera and uh, some other stuff. And his brother was super. He said his brother was you know more talented than he was. And his brother drowned when he was 15 in the family pool. He had a, an epileptic seizure in the pool and drowned. Wow. And so that, and that's why he, I believe he was at Juilliard Val was when that happened. So it was just this devastating, obviously, thing yeah. that, you know, it permanently impacted him. And, and there, even his brother's artwork has appeared in at least one of his early films. They put it in like the set decorations in the background. So that's kind of cool. But yeah, I was just going to say, whenever someone is as talented and successful as Val is, and he says, yeah, you know, my brother was even better than I was. You wonder what that career could have been like, you know? Yeah. For sure, he his he had also a, uh, a a relative that had murdered a couple of people in West Hollywood, <laughs> stuck them in a trunk. Really? Yeah, yeah. That didn't yeah. make it into the documentary. <laughs> I'm trying to think of uh, what the actual relation was, but that happened in uh, what year was that? It looks like an older newspaper that I'm looking at. I can't I can't pull up the date, but it, it looks like 60s or 50s. But I think it might have to do. Well, here's. Let's see. My friend Shannon Mead uh, did all this legwork on this, and she sent the information to me. It was 59. But, uh, yeah, gunshot wound and stuck in a truck of a car. And it has a relation to uh, to Val Kilmer. I forget exactly what it was. What? But... And then Killers. Yeah, anyway. So, yeah, that that yeah, is like... uh, an interesting thing. But. Anyway, that just stuck in my mind. I wanted to that, that uh, address <laughs> that because that's a that's a nice little bit of trivia in a family. Not nice, but you know. Oh, and by Val the way, Val Kilmer, I barely knew her. <laughs> <laughs> um, one last thing I wanted to talk about um, in the kind of news of the week. Uh, you made a cool post on Facebook, uh, and I already knew this, but I'd, I'd never heard it before. You were a radio DJ at a country station. Mm-hmm. In central mm-hmm. Michigan, back in the eight early eighties, right? And yeah, you I, I, um, yeah. dug up an old you <laughs> you dug up an old <laughs> tape of you doing your job, which is amazing. My DJ skills. <laughs> 
for the very best in new country, tune into the Hitbound Showdown weeknights at 7.05 right here on the Big M. Every night we'll premiere two new country songs. You tell us which one you like best, and it may become the Hitbound Song of the Week. The Hitbound Showdown, only on your country music station, WMLM. I'm Scott Michaels. Be with you here till just about 6 o'clock. We're going to take you back now with the Statler Brothers. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. It was, uh, it was funny. I, you know, I just, uh, I put it up for giggles and, uh, and it's funny. I really like country music. That's what people are going, Oh my God, my ears, it's awful. And I'm like, I don't know. I like it. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, it was an interesting little chapter. And, uh, and that's, I, you know, there were like two things I, I kept from my education. It was typing in high school and and voice work with with the broadcasting. That was those are the two things right. that, in, in all of my education that I ever used. <laughs> <laughs> I know I went to business school and I learned a lot of important things, but probably the most important I learned was learning how to use Microsoft Word and Excel, like actual skills yeah. that you know you actually need in in your life. What could have been with your DJ career, Scott? <laughs> it's funny now. Troy said last night because you, 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 your old, your Michigan accent is really pronounced. You know, he's really pronounced in that. It's like I don't know if I had an accent. <laughs> apparently, I did, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> apparently, it's really obvious in that video. <laughs> I didn't. I had somebody have to point it out to me. Um, and our uh, our mutual friend Kelly, she uh, went to college near where you were DJing at that time. She went to Central Michigan. Oh, right. Mount Pleasant. That's like right above us, about fire, about 40 minutes fire above Fire up uh, chips. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Did you, uh, is there any other news you wanted to? No. I would say August is here, and that's like, I always call that the, the holiday month. And not, in a, you know, it's like Maryland. You've got the Manson <laughs> thing. You've got Princess Diana. You've got the Menendez verse. And, and that's, you know, it's a, it's a pretty magical month as far as all this, all this stuff goes. All concentrated. And, and both our birthdays? Yeah. Yeah. When's yours? Is this your birthday? Oh, Mine's August fourth. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah. so you like right before Maryland Day? Yeah, I was born two weeks after Maryland died, but uh, uh, and mm. uh, yeah, yeah. And my birthday is the same birthday as Roman Polanski and Vincent Bugliosi, August eighteenth. I have um, Barack Obama is the big the biggest one that I have. Um, man, wait, what 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 day is yours? Eighteen. Yeah, because um, Elvis died on August 16th, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I have now outlived, I'm now older than Elvis was when he died. I have outlived <laughs> him by a year now. I think I am Humphrey Bogart's age right now, that he died. Oh, really? When he yeah. died? <laughs> so, uh, did you get any hate mail or anything? Oh, hate mail. Um, hate mail. This is, okay... Troy saves these things for me because I can't. Oh, you know, I told in the Patreon video that uh, uh, the Janet Lee story about, you know, my bringing a knife to her, uh, her book signing. <laughs> and one of the com one of the comments is just kind of a funny one. She goes, and that's funny. What a childish moron unsubscribing immediately. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, it's childish. No doubt about it. Um, you are somebody, it's like you are following the wrong person if you are not amused yeah. by that story. And there was one about, oh, here's one. This was interesting. Uh, this is regarding the Anthony Bourdain thing that I had when he, when he took the tour and, uh, yeah. it was, we recorded it. My friend Jane recorded it and I uploaded it. So, uh, she writes, this is my first time viewing this video. What disturbs me the most is the man talking saying that what happened to the Black Dahlia was spectacular. Which it was. I mean, you know, look up the definition. I mean, it's like, it's, it's crazy. Right. And, uh, and you are seriously a creep because what was done to her was absolute butcher, absolutely butchery. Men like you have no heart, no soul. And Anthony Bourdain, God rest his soul. He will be missed. This is the guy that's talking about autoerotic asphyxiation and all the murders, but he's, he, God rest his soul. He will be missed. But to the creep interviewer of this video, be careful what you're saying because you seem to be a sadist. <laughs> that truly disturbed me. <laughs> and it should be to others, including that lady in the van. Must be my friend. Jane. Men run the world and women are preyed on. This creep who think the brutal <laughs> murder of a beautiful woman, human being was spectacular. You should go Jesus. to jail for that period. The Black Dahlia is infamous amongst other sad Hollywood celebrity stories. R.I.P. But uh, but I looked uh, it up because really, I said something. Wrote was, a book. You know, 
I talked to the uh, about the Manson murders, and I said that they were fantastic. And if you look up the definition of fantastic, they were spectacular. I, I did look right. this up. It says, you know, an elaborate show or display pertaining to the nature of a show or a spectacle, marked or characterized as a great display. And the Black Dahlia was to whomever did it. You know, that was that was set up. What they did to her was a creation and that's what i meant by that it was it wasn't like wow it was right. so cool it wasn't like that it wasn't cool it was <laughs> spectacular it was like fantastic is not you know necessarily a, oh my god it's so wonderful it's, it's like you know the word exciting bad things can also be exciting yeah yeah exactly so <laughs> doesn't mean it's i know fun. it's just kind of funny <laughs> that all that thought went into it um i was like all right whatever but uh, block, you know, Troy blocks us and he saves me the best. Block. Yeah, sends the best for this. <laughs> but the other, yes. the piece of email I got that was interesting, that it said, uh, you know, we know, we talked about Zach selling the, Zach Bagans sold the LaBianca house. And apparently yeah. it's slated for demolition now. So, uh, oh, so that will happen. Bummer. Yeah, it is. What a bummer. So, um, but Which yeah. is what w- w- would have likely happened anyways. So, you know, him buying it, I guess, kept it alive for a couple more years. But, you know, it's kind of inevitable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's L.A. We got some nice notes on Patreon. Uh, Deborah told us, you guys rock. Keep up all the good work. Thank you, Deborah. And uh, Thanks, Jonathan Deborah. said he'd been a Jonathan said he's been a fan since of the since the website and on to six degrees. I love what you do and proud to support you. Keep up the great work. And we also got some nice Patreon notes from Becca and Elaine. So, um, we do have a, a Patreon page where you can get advanced, um, look at these episodes when they come out, seeing before everybody else does. And we also do an extra mini show, which are usually, you know, in that 45 minute to an hour range. Um, so we call them mini shows, but they're actually gotten to be pretty long. Uh, and we also post those to Patreon. So uh, those totally. are Patreon yeah. exclusive. Solely so, for Patreon, yeah. Yeah, and you can get access to that for as little as two bucks a month. So check out our Patreon, uh, Dearly Departed Podcast on Patreon. Uh, go check it out. We just recorded a new episode for Patreon just before we did this one. So, um, And we, we really appreciate everybody for supporting us over there. So uh, main feature? Yes, let's talk about it. Yeah, it's Todd Browning's Freaks. It's time for the main feature. Google gobble, Google gobble. We accept her, <laughs> one of us. I uh, had never actually watched this movie. It had been on my list for ever and ever, and I finally watched it this past week because we wanted to do this episode, and I freaking loved it. It's so mm-hmm. good. It, it exceeded my expectations, to be honest. I thought it was really, really brilliant. Uh, filmmaking and the story behind it is equally as fascinating as the story was of the film itself i thought um but for people who don't know it's about um sideshow acts otherwise you know referred to as freaks um and it's based on them you know with this uh either a circus or a carnival right yeah it's a traveling sideshow yeah yeah um, uh, made in 1932 and, uh, Todd Browning, the director, uh, he actually had originally worked in a, in, he had actually worked a, as a carnival. He had been a contortionist and, uh, was, uh, an, and a carnival barker, uh, for years, starting when he was a teenager, uh, before he began his film career. So it's interesting. He had wanted to do this story, which was adapted from a short story called Spurs, uh, for years and years. He'd been trying to get MGM to do it going back to the twenties during the silent era. And finally, they finally did it. It's fascinating that MGM produced it. And there's the stories about the cast of the Wizard of Oz going to the commissary and everyone, you know, uh, they were so freaked out about how outrageous their costumes were. Uh, during the filming of The Wizard of Oz. And then the, the freaks thing, they just had to give them their own place because nobody could deal with being in the room with them. You know, the, the Siamese twins and the, uh, and the half man and all that stuff. It was just too much. And it's shocking that MGM made the movie. It, uh, it really is shocking <laughs> that they made this movie. It, 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 cause it doesn't seem like something MGM would do back then. They were very prestigious, you know, what more stars than in the heavens or whatever their, their tagline was at the time. And, uh, and what's also interesting was Todd Browning had just done Dracula for Universal the year before and that which kicked off, you know, Universal's whole monster craze in the thirties. And I'm really yeah. surprised that he didn't just do this there. It makes, I, it's, I, I don't know the whole story about why it went to MGM yeah. and not Universal, but. 
Yeah, that's interesting. And maybe they just gave him say, you come in, you come here and we will, you could do whatever you want. We'll give you a movie. And he's like, that, Oh, that must yeah. have been it. <laughs> <laughs> you can mention Louis Mayer going, what? They kept the sideshow acts like in their own, the actors in their own tent on, you know, the, the lot, um, mm-hmm. to keep from disturbing the, the other people on the lot. And, and they had, they had their own commissary and everything. So they were really kept separate. Almost kind of like you know the Munchkins being kept down the street in the hotel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Trucked it's, over it's, every day. <laughs> it was such an interesting movie because they they gave every one of those sideshow performers their own moment to shine. You know, mm-hmm. they they had their little mo- like um, the uh, the half man, half woman. Uh, you know, literally not like. A trans person was literally down the middle, half man. He would just talk and he'd talk and right. bend to both sides. And then, uh, you know, Johnny Eck had his thing where he climbed the ladder. This is the half man. And, uh, yeah, yeah they, they all had a chance. Prince Randian, you know, made full, who has no arms and no legs, uh, would full, uh, roll a cigarette in his mouth. You know, they let him do their, Amazing. their little spiel. You know, he, they got to, got to do it. So. It's it's also I mean despite the kind of derogatory title it's gotten a lot of uh, credit over the years for showing um, these circus performers as real people. Yeah, yeah, and it was it's also it's considered derogatory derogatory nowadays, but that's the term they embrace themselves. So I you know be it un PC for this it's like, I don't care you know they they called themselves that they embraced it, and uh, so. And it's still the name of the movie. So I, I, it's just, it wasn't disrespectful at all to these people. In fact, if anything else, it, it was respectful to these people because it showed how loyal they were to themselves. And, uh, and I think that that was that, that sort of code of, uh, honor that they had, you know, you mess with one, you mess with all, uh, kind of a thing. Right. The whole one of us, you know, we accept you. I mean, that was a big deal when, uh, when during the wedding in the, uh, in the uh, in the film, what a what a sinister movie! It's fascinating, just sinister. It was such a controversial film when it came out. Uh, it did not do well. It was a you know it was a, it was financially a loss. Um, the UK banned it for like thirty years. Can you believe that? Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. You, that was we talked <laughs> about this before. They banned a Clockwork Orange until the nineties. Uh, the Exorcist too. They were all they couldn't you couldn't watch them there. You couldn't couldn't get them. Freaks came out in 1932 and you couldn't see it in the UK until the sixties. Um, mm. and, and, you know, it, so it was Irving Thalberg, who we've talked about a, a lot. I, I've read one of his big biographies. I'm a big fan of, you know, his life. Uh, he was the head of production for MGM at the time, uh, the boy wonder. And the original running time was about 90 minutes long. And he's the one that basically took the film away which was common at that time. He took it away from Todd Browning and chopped it up, chopped it down to about, I think 64 minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the original full length version is considered lost. So, um, and I I would love to see the full version because you definitely can feel this kind of ham fisted intro and, and ending that would kind of slapped on, onto an otherwise really great film. Did you, I noticed, I saw on YouTube, there's a couple of alternative endings that were actually filmed. Oh, and, uh, I've never and, seen and, that. And no. for anyone that haven't seen this movie yet, I mean, you're, these are going to be spoilers all over the place, but, um, you know, so if you haven't seen the movie, you should probably stop now and, uh, before we, where we talk about it, cause, and then watch it and come back. Cause speaking of spoilers, that final scene in the rain is so brilliantly done. Mm-hmm. It's so good. It's so good. All shot yeah. at low level, you know, kind of under with the wagon wheels under the wagons with everybody in this chase through the mud. Uh, it's so, so interesting. And, and it just gets cut. It just gets cut off it, almost in the middle of it. It feels like, I guess, before they catch up with her and attack her, I guess that was t- too shocking maybe for the for audiences. Yeah. But it just there's a quick dissolve back to the, the scene that the film opens with. Right. I mean, yeah, to, to clarify, the, the story is about the sideshow freaks. And there's also the strong man and the, the trapeze artist woman. And the, tra- and they find out that one of the freaks, one of the little people, Harry Dahl, had money. So the strong man and the trapeze artist, uh, 
to figure up a plan for her to fake being in love with Harry Dahl and mm-hmm. get married to him. And then she tries to poison him and the other freaks find out about it. And that's the spectacular ending. So yeah, the revenge, uh, and the see, especially Prince Randy and the guy they call the caterpillar man, uh, you know, crawling through the mud like a cat, like a, like a caterpillar. And right? it is with a knife in his hand, in his mouth. You know, I know what he's going to do with it. He didn't have arms or legs, but, uh, uh, it's just so, and you know, just crawling through the mud, and yeah, it was really, really, really something to see. And uh, but that's a code of code of con or code of honor, you know, for them. Yeah, uh, and uh, Thalberg was no one of his innovations was test screenings, which is common practice now. But you would take a, a edit, early edit of the film, and you would screen it for a test audience, and gauge their reaction, and then you would go and make changes if you felt like it needed it. And apparently, at these test screenings, people were running out of the theater <laughs> at the, the 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 site of some of these yeah. performers back then. Yeah, for sure, I can understand that. I remember when. Uh, a- about in the nineties, I saw several times the Jim Rose circus side show, I guess. And, uh, and he sort of revived it, but it was all with geeks. I mean, there's freaks who are physically, uh, different, you know, they were born differently. The Siamese twins, the man with, you know, uh, uh, you know, short arms or something like that. They were physical, you know, what they would call deformities. Uh, geeks are the people that create themselves, you know, the tattooed guy, mm-hmm. the pierced guy, uh, eating animal, eating bugs, you know, that kind of thing. And right. Jim Rose, uh, Jim Rose Circus Sideshow was, is all geeks. And there was the one guy called the plunger and it was just acts, but people People were puking watching this stuff. And this is in the 90s. The, Mr. Lifto, who, who had a pierced uh, nipples and a pierced penis, and he was, you know, picking up like big weights and swinging them around on his nipples. And, you know, people just couldn't cope with that. So that was a small level right. of what, what freaks was like for people. I mean, they, you know, they, they reacted very differently back then. And, and, you know, call it exploitation. So, so what? You know, they were born, they found their, their, their tribe and, uh, and they all loved each other and they, and, and it's how they and it's how they made their living. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. uh, when they weren't doing sideshows, they were performing in you know what films they could get. So yeah, yeah, it was interesting to to, to read about how um, some of them were in different films. You know, you know, portraying uh, Johnny Yak the Half Man and Schlitzie was in a, was in a few different films too. It's just interesting because you just think Freaks is all they ever did. But uh, and what an impact it made. I mean, I remember when I was a kid. In the back of magazines, there were always the, the these ads for, uh, you know, the the three legged man and the uh, very. It was called Very Special People. Was the first book that was made probably in the seventies about these people, and I, huh. I I couldn't I could not stop looking at that. The Guinness Book of World Records came out, and there was another one that was that man that was so big he had to be buried in a piano case. You know, it was just stuff like that was just so fascinating to me, and. um and still is. And that's why, that's why, you know, I love all this stuff. Um, when recently, uh, Troy and I were in Florida and we went to Gibsonton and Gib or Gibtown uh, is where all the circus performers would go on the off season. And it started with, mm-hmm. uh, G- Jeannie and Al Tomaney. Al Tomaney was like eight feet tall and Jeannie Tomaney was like 18 inches. She was a half lady and they got married and just decided to create this place where these carnies could go in the off season. And they put, they created what was called the giants camp. And it was all these little, little houses, little tiny little cabins that they had and 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 they were they had a bait store. And Gibson was just this focal point for all of these people, place they could go and, you know, they have even the post office, like the 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 counter of the post office is only like two feet, so little people could use it. Uh-huh. I mean it was really accommodating to uh to to those people because they that's their it was their yeah. tribe. And that's where the uh Show it was Showtown Bar, Showman's Bar, where you know these people. Well, a lot of them did do pretty hardcore drinking, and uh, and you, you know you would just see these unusual people sitting at the bar, and uh, you know just amongst each other. It's fascinating. It's not like that anymore. I mean, Gibsonton is sort of one of those places. I I, I described it as a um, you know, place where people end up. Uh, now, you know, right. before it was, it's not, it's not a glamorous place. Like I'd hope they don't embrace 
nowadays, that sort of culture. Yeah, the Barnum Museum's in Sarasota, not far away, and it's still the showman's uh, sort of union that's there, but there's mm-hmm. not much tribute to to those people that made it well known. It's not really a tourist destination, although there was bar one bar there that we went to. It was called the uh, Alafia Brewing Company, and we went on a Friday night, and they did a proper show inside with the posters like this. They had the Fiji Mermaid, and they had, uh, uh, you know, the the 20 foot boa constrictor and you know the, the little boy came out pressing his face into glass that was neat to see because that was a genuine nod to the old gibsonton but um right yeah it, it was still a neat place to uh to visit most definitely um so do you want to get into the uh the actors sure 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 um i was gonna mention uh, uh wallace ford who was mm-hmm. uh the kind of one of the, the the main good guys uh that was kind of befriended the 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 circus performers um Frozo, he was a, yeah. uh, in real life in real life he was a world war 1 veteran and i uh, i thought it was interesting his background uh, his he was born Samuel Grundy Jones and where he got the name Wallace Ford is interesting and also tragic uh his childhood friend i believe they were kind of riding the rails and you know hitchhiking around and whatever and uh his childhood friend had an accident uh with one of the trains and fell i think and was run over or something like or crushed and died so when Wallace Ford began his showbiz career he took on that name of his friend his friend was named Wallace Ford so he changed his name from Samuel Jones to Wallace Ford as kind of a tribute to his friend um, and that's hmm. that's that would that became his stage name. Wow, interesting. He's a, he was a really likable, a really likable guy in the movie. I love that. There's a memorable yeah. scene with him and Schlitzy. That's so sweet. Um, mm. Yeah, just a friend to the unusual people. Yeah. And he had a long uh, Hollywood career and stage career, and he had supporting roles also in The Lost Patrol and Shadow of a Doubt, uh, Spellbound. Um, and he passed away on June 11th, 1966. He was uh, 68. Uh, he had a heart failure. Mm-hmm. Um, he passed away at the what the the motion picture country home, the the um, the kind of retirement community that's in Woodland Hills. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, a lot of them did die out there. That was a cool place. And then his kind of. And then his kind of fellow sort of protagonist and friend to 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 the sideshow acts, uh, Layla Hyams. Uh, she mm. played Venus, um, and uh, she she passed away on uh, December fourth, nineteen seventy seven, at seventy two from also from natural causes. Yeah, she was uh, my friend Gary Sweeney did a ton of research on her. I guess he's a, he's going to try to get a book off the ground about her. But uh she was I mean again, they were the two likable, you know, that were quote unquote normal uh in the movie. And uh her name was Venus in the movie. She was in Island of the Lost Souls too, but that was like the long ago one. She was in silent movies and stuff. But uh but yeah, very and she was uh she was yeah, she died at in seventy seven, was scattered at sea, uh from from helicopters, mm. I understand. But uh <laughs> but um and then uh Olga Baklanova, who was the unlikable person <laughs> in this in this film. Yeah. Uh Cleopatra, um really the antagonist, she's the one that schemes uh to 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 you know fake being in love with this uh, little person so she can get his money. Uh she had a really interesting life. She was born in Moscow to kind of a showbiz family there and ultimately immigrated to the US and became a citizen here. Um and uh she passed away on September 6th, 1974. She was 81 um and I believe she passed away in Switzerland and there was a uh, I saw somewhere that she may have had Alzheimer's but it's un- unconfirmed. Yeah, I've heard that she died in some sort of retirement community, so it makes sense. Uh, she was, um, you know, there was, I don't know, I was reading something about kudos for her acting. I mean, they, she was chewing up the scenery in this movie. I mean, it was just like, <laughs> right. you know, it was, there was nothing subtle about that performance. I and mean, when she was laughing, it wasn't mm-hmm. like a ha ha. It was like a, <laughs> you know, it was so, <laughs> it was so over the top. So I love her drunk brooding though in the big, you know, the big dinner scene. Uh, oh, and then she starts mocking and yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That is, um, yeah, she was. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a poor movie. None of those people were, except for those two leads, were good actors. You know, they're, no one, they're probably the only real actors uh, in the movie, the uh, uh, Lila Hames and, um, and Wallace Ford. But the others are, are all mm-hmm. 
not really good actors. The other and the, the sideshow people were not actors at all. Surprisingly, they they carried themselves. But like Violet and Daisy Hilton, you know, they got they got a walk by, and you know, oh, hello, and that was the end. It was like they had twenty minutes of filming, <laughs> you know. But uh, I really, uh, I got to say that the the, the the doll family, Daisy Earls and Harry Earls, they really grew on me on this film. I thought that that for being not professional trained actors, I thought they did a really good job. Um. I don't know if that was Browning getting a good performance out of them or, or what it was, but I, I liked them in it. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a love story with a brother and a sister. That's kind of interesting. That kind of creeps some people yeah. out. <laughs> right. right. Brother and sister in real life. Yeah. Um, and in, you know, Schlitzy, who probably I don't think really had the, the mental capacity to, to act is, you know, really act, act. Um, it's interesting watching mm-hmm. him in these scenes because, um, it's almost like you're getting his real reactions to what's happening in a way. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I loved, mean? Love performing and love being the center of attention yeah. and loved affection. Uh, and yeah, it was clear. I guess Schlitzy could, they say she could, one of her big, well, to him, uh, uh, one of her big, one of her big tricks. You say her because Schlitzy was billed as a, a woman, you know, Schlitzy the female, yeah. you know, the Aztec girl or whatever. What, what princess princess ha ha was one of them <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. and uh but you know just referred to her as a female because the the, the dresses that they put on her and a little bow in her hair but it was actually a, a male but he was incontinent which is why the the, the war what what she wore and um she wore dresses but, born with microcephaly um mm-hmm. which means uh, she uh, she she had a small cranium basically and so uh which also meant you know a smaller brain and so mm-hmm. it affected, you know, mentally affected. If so, physically affected and mentally affected. Um, uh, I was wondering. I was going to ask you about this. You know, of course, the R- Ramones had their one of their big hits, which was called Pinhead, um, mm-hmm. which was about Schlitzy. Uh, and they turned, you know, Google Gobble, which it was what the freaks in the show movie say. They turned that into Gaba Gaba Hey, um, which mm-hmm. I thought was interesting. Was now you, of course, were a big Ramones fan. Are the Ramones your entry to freaks? Was it because of the song Pinhead? No, not at all. No, in fact, it wasn't until many years later I realized Gaba Gaba was a play on the Freak's Google Gobble. I didn't know mm. that for years. So, uh, and Pinhead, I didn't get that. I mean, there was Zippy the Pinhead, but I was never a fan of that comic based on Schlitzy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I, um, but no, I didn't know about the, uh, the, that I knew the song, but I, I was telling Troy last night, it's like, I listen to songs, I can sing songs, but I don't process what they're about, you know? So then you got <laughs> the, we accept you, we accept you, one of us. And, you know, uh, and, and I don't want to be a Pinhead no more. I just want, yeah, it's just, uh, I didn't really process yeah. that it was about being a freak in their own interpretation of of it but uh but schlitzy and it's funny because uh, schlitzy lived at the end of her life on santa monica boulevard at uh just a couple of streets um uh east of western right by the 101 where you know okay. the tiki theater that porno theater it's like almost right across <laughs> the street from there and uh and schlitzy apparently had a sister. I was watching this guy called Wayne Kaiser on YouTube and he did a really extensive biography. I didn't know uh, a lot of the stuff that he had, but he literally was born with a sister named Anthelia. And, uh, and no one knows really what happened to the sister, but like most of them were sold. Like a lot of these children uh, at a young age that were born unusual, different shapes and, and, Etc. cetera, uh, were sold off by their parents and uh, to the circus. And te- technically not technically not legal, but kind of people just turned and looked the other way when it happened back then, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Every, yeah. So Schlitzy went by the name Simon Metz. Then it was Schlitzy Surtees. You know, it all had to do with their with with his guardians. And at the end of his right. life, another a guy by the name, I guess, after they were done with Schlitzy, dropped her off at a hospital because they didn't know what to do with her. And uh, and they were <laughs> going to give her a psychiatric evaluation. And, of course, she wouldn't be able to support herself. And then, apparently, this person who worked at the hospital recognized Schlitzy and got in touch with a guy who was running a sideshow. At this point, Schlitzy was in her 60s. And uh, and this guy convinced the hospital to let him adopt her and put her up in this little apartment and it would take her out to, you know, Hollywood Boulevard or, or Griffith Park. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, MacArthur Park and would just you just dance around and perform for people. 
And right. uh, just a, a kind person. Although it's interesting because Tiny Doll, who um, I'll show you. I, I got some of my freak stuff out here, but I don't know what's showing. Yeah. But Tiny Doll was was the youngest of the Doll family. There was Harry, Daisy, Gracie, and Tiny. And Tiny autographed this for me. This is her with the cast of Freaks. But she wasn't actually in the movie. And it's funny because Ugh. her brother and sister, there's Daisy. I don't think Harry is in this. But um, there's Prince Randian, and, and it's it's almost the entire cast. And there's Todd Browning back there, too. You, but you can, bring that, can you bring that over to the camera? Yeah, I can. Let's see if I can do it without the reflection of... Uh, yeah, there it is. Wow. So if you're watching the video version of this, we can see this. There's mm-hmm. the, the there's Daisy or yeah it's Daisy Dolls. There are the Hilton sisters, co-joined twins. There's Schlitzie, Zip and Pip, Johnny Eck, Hugo. I forget his name, but that's Gracie. Wait, that must be Daisy. No, that's Tiny right there. See, I'm looking at it backwards. And uh, <laughs> Todd Browning is um, back here, I think. And um, but yeah, this but but the point was Tiny Doll when asked about Schlitzie. Is the only person I've ever heard anything say negative. She said that she, she said that uh, she said Schlitzie was ferocious. So she, you know, really? she would like bite people and attack people. Yeah. So maybe it was when she what? was provoked or something. Oh, look at there's Schlitzie behind me. Yeah. It kind of looks like me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather. That's funny because all the stories I've ever heard was that he was very. She was a very sweet person, and you know, yeah. like you said, like being the center of attention and like performing, and um, couldn't could m- not speak very well. Could only speak mainly in monosyllabic words, but could form sentences. But they said they got the sense that she could understand most of what was being said to her, um, even if she couldn't verbalize back as well. Hmm. Yeah, they said she, one of her big tricks was she could count to 10, but she could never say the word seven. I think it was, I don't know, it was two syllables. I don't know. But, uh, right. but no, I loved, I loved Schlitz. In fact, when I turned 40, it's almost 20 years ago now, uh, that's when I realized I was never going to have a legitimate job. So that's when I, I got my Schlitzy tattoo. It's so cool. It's <laughs> amazing. It's yeah, so that cool. was, I mean, I was thrilled with that. So, so when, after Schlitzie died, you know, she was buried in a grave at, uh, Queen of Heaven Cemetery out in Rowan Heights and unmarked. Um, and that was, I was going to say that was, uh, she passed away on September 24th, 1971, uh, 70 years old. And I think possibly it was pneumonia. Yeah. Bronchial pneumonia is the cause of death. Mm-hmm. And she died in a, in a, uh, nursing home right on, um, Fountain and uh, just off Western, yeah, it's called the Fountain View okay. Nursing Home or something, and uh, and that's where she ended up passing away, and was buried in an unmarked grave. And my friend Cece found out about that and let me know. And I'm like, you know, I, at that point we hadn't been marking people's graves yet. We haven't done any of that stuff yet, so I just let it go. And then they started talking about yeah. it on the Find a Death message board. And then Shelly Lichoff, another friend of mine, said, well, let's start a fundraiser. And she got in touch with the cemetery. And they said, well, the only thing that was wrong is that they didn't uh, pay the bill for the tombstone. So we just raised whatever huh. Shelly did the fundraiser, raised the money, and we're going to have the ceremony. Now, this is a funny part. Funny in a bizarre way that things work out. So we contacted the cemetery, made the arrangements. The stone was going to be... um the stone was going to be placed, and we decided to have the ceremony. And, and uh, Vern Langdon was this guy who had a big carny history, and he came along and did a eulogy. We contacted the cemetery and said, we want to do this thing. And they said, well, we can we can give you a priest, but we're going to have to charge you $300 for the priest to come out and do this. So we're like, no. You know, we just – we just uh uh, no, <laughs> you're not going to pay for this. I mean, it's a priest. He should be able to, you know, give me five minutes and do a blessing. How, you know, in a Catholic cemetery. Anyway, right. we got our own priest, a gentleman uh, by the name of Brian stepped up and said, I'll do it. I'm a minister. And, and he put together this lovely eulogy. We took uh, a bus out there, about a dozen of us. And, uh, and Brian gave this eulogy that was non-denominational. And it was just a really lovely, mm-hmm. touching, uh, eulogy. And we unveiled the gravestone, uh, the tombstone, the grave marker. And I put a pink hat on it with a big feather because that's what the, the line was in freaks. You know, we're going to get you a big hat with a big feather on it. And, uh, we uh. put that on the grave. So then later on, we find out that Brian, who's a buddy of mine, and I, I got permission to talk about this from him because I didn't want to be disrespectful to anybody. Sure. But it looks like Brian was a minister in the Church of Satan. 
<laughs> no, he never specified. <laughs> so, you know, so we got to talking. I mean, I. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny the way we're talking. Because Satanism, you know, there, there's a lot of stigma attached. It's more about atheism, really. You know, it's just about it's just sure, about sure. Uh, living your best life to yourself and not worrying about what's going to happen afterwards. But it goes under this. It's like Anton LaVey. It's show business. That's what it is. Yeah. It's just show business. Right. It's punk rock. And it's like it, it was more to freak people out than uh, for a lot of people. Right. But Brian, again... I had no idea. It was a lovely ceremony. The Catholic Church would never think to ask. I'm ceremony. a minister. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the church wouldn't do it. So we got another guy, and it's just ironic <laughs> that the you know I'm not. He's not a, like a blood. There's none of that. I mean, Brian's just a decent, funny right. guy who's an artist, and uh, and uh, but it was just you know a, a, a fascinating little twist to the to the story, which is um, yeah, it's funny. Funny, Ben. You- <laughs> it's funny how things work out. But uh, <laughs> and I have a buddy named St- uh, Steve Belgard who's been working on this Schlitzy documentary for years. It's called One of Us. And I reached out because of the, the pandemic and everything kind of put a kibosh on stuff. And they're working on the an- animation stuff, which is nice because he, he t- I'm going to read you what uh, what he wrote me about. It. He said we're editing it and October and the animation will be finished. Principal photography is done. Andrew Lug Oldham already did the narration. Uh, Steve's daughter Emma is composing the score, and all they're doing is just have to put it all together so in 2022 what's interesting is that the young adults who are working on this are on the autism uh, spectrum and the people doing the animation and his daughter emma is also on the uh, autism uh, spectrum so it's an inclusive documentary about this lovely character that uh, that uh, everyone knows but doesn't really know what schlitzy was all about and um yeah it's a it's a funny story i love that Love that story, and uh, and and also Schlitzy is uh, uh, a friend. Well, friend, an acquaintance, Naomi Grossman portrays Schlitzy, uh, aka Pepper, in American Horror Story, and it's a recurring character, a pinhead. When they did the uh, uh, institutional, um, I forget that was called the one with uh, with the really dark season. Everyone loves. I, it just really bothered me because it's so dark. But Pepper the Pinhead is. Played by Naomi Grossman and is based on Schlitzy and Freak Show. Freak Show, that whole season. Did you watch that American Horror Story season? I, I'm not a I'm not a big horror fan, so no, I have not wa- I haven't really watched that show much. It's it was the whole season was about uh Jessica Lang running a very much like Olga, you know, maybe uh the character might have been slightly based on her. Um, ran this traveling sideshow and they used actual, you know, people in it who were mm. born with disabilities. And my friend Matt Fraser, who is a friend, uh, was a thalidomite. Uh, you know, Matt was born with, uh, uh, short arms, very short, like, like to here. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it was from a, a drug that was given to people in England for while they were pregnant to, um, to help with morning sickness and ended up creating right. these, what they call birth defects back then. I don't know yeah. what the hell it's a huge scandal. Anymore. It's one of the biggest scandals in history of when it comes to that. Um, I can't remember what, what it was called, but I remember uh, reading about it years ago and I, um, it was a huge, huge, I think someone had brought me the possibility of doing a, even doing a documentary about the whole thing. I'm sure. Yeah. Like Matt, a whole generation Matt, it affected almost. He was, um, Matt, Matt Fraser is his name. And I helped him when I was living in England with his first show called CeeLo. And it was about seal, the seal boy who had the same, it wasn't through the same cause of, of, uh, of the thalidomide drug, sure. but it, but he was also born with that. So Matt's first show, uh, was about CeeLo. And then Matt features quite heavily in this, uh, in that season of, uh, American Horror Story, which is really good. They had the princess, the little, um, from East India. She's, she's, it's the littlest person in the world. And, uh, they had, uh, the, and they, they made, um, the young lead, I forget his name, be like Lobster Boy, who we'll talk about in a little bit. So it was fascinating. The whole season was based on real freak show performers, and a lot of them were actually in this movie. I love that Matt just embraces that. You know, he's like a black belt. I mean, Matt, Matt's, Matt rocks. I mean, he's awesome. But he, um, and he's, he, I helped on a show, another show that we made called Freak Out, uh, that, that was, that was, uh, on in England. There was a Euro Trash and another show I worked on, but Freak, Freak Out was a good show. And, uh, anyway, 
It's what people had embr- about embracing it, you know, just owning it, right. uh, right. you know, being stared at your whole life. And people, you know, here's like, I, I don't know, I kind of got over that a long time ago, where if I see somebody with, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's appropriate, and I'll say, so what's up with that? You know, what did you, you know, what, what, uh, uh, what's the story? Instead of pretending it's not there. Yeah. I was in an elevator not that long ago with a woman with uh, only one leg. And it's just, a, does that recent? Did that just happen? Or, you know, it just, it, it's like, it's right there. I think they, people would appreciate, right. uh, the honesty or the, you know, just the, you want to know, ask, you know, and they can, they can say piss off. Sure. So, um, but 90% of the time, whenever I've done that, I've never had a problem with it. So we'll just say hundred percent of the time I've done that. People have been really receptive to talking about stuff like that. So rest in peace, Schlitzy. We love it. Yeah, at Queen of uh, Heaven Cemetery. And uh, thanks to the nice people at Find a Death Forum. It's done. She has a gravestone. It's great. It's a good story. And now you, that's a tradition for you. You you guys do fundraisers for various, uh, to, to, for unmarked graves of various celebrities and people that have kind of, uh, you know, died in obscurity or, or uh, died without money and have been buried in unmarked graves. I think it's really cool. Yeah. When we were in Gibsonton, we went to find a couple of people's graves. We found the Tomanis, Al and, and Jeannie, the little lady and the giant. And we were in a cemetery and of course it was closed. The gates, I mean, uh, the office was closed because of COVID, but there were two people in it that we spent hours, Troy and I did going up and down every aisle to try to find these people. One of them was, uh, Gracie doll of the, of the doll sisters. And the other guy was, um, one of the munchkins too. Well, all the dolls were, um, were, were munchkins in the wizard of Oz. All four of them were. And, uh, and there were three lollipop kids. We know who Jerry Marin was, who passed away not that long ago. And, uh, and then Harry doll was the other one of the doll family was the other lollipop kid. And there was one other guy and I'll, um, with, he was in that cemetery with, uh, with, uh, Gracie doll, uh, Jackie Gerlich was his name, but, uh, we had no luck. We had no luck finding him, but a lot of those people now was, was it, I don't want to get into all that yet. Sorry. I'll stop. I got to stop talking for a second. <laughs> Uh, well, we're talking about the doll family. So uh, they were uh, German dwarfs who immigrated to the U.S. And then all four of them went on to act in films and working on, you know, various circus acts. Um, that's how they made their living. And, you know, we talked earlier about how um, sometimes these performers would take on the name, last names of whoever their guardians were or whatever. And uh, Daisy and Harry went, went under the names Earls for a time because that mm-hmm. was the name of their manager when they came to the U.S. And then I think after their aunt manager died, they then changed it back again. But for a time, you know, two of the dolls had the last name of Earls. Um, so I thought that was kind of an interesting tradition um, back then. Um, yeah, they changed back to doll after their manager died. I think they were, they, yeah, they were born Schneider, then Earls, mm. they took the name Earls and then they, they went to the dolls. I don't know if they ever, well, their death certificate says Earls on it, but in parentheses, somebody did write, you know, Harry doll, Daisy doll on it. So, mm. um, so yeah. And they went into the dancing and Daisy dolls. Daisy and Harry were both, they were both three foot three. Mm-hmm. Um, that's and- little. Yeah. And they had to do, I mean, they really had to do some real acting. I mean, they had to do real scenes. They had to carry, you know, they they had to hold their own. Um, They weren't, you know, uh, in the background. Um, Mm -hmm. And I I don't know. I, 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 I liked, I thought they both did really fine performances for not being, you know, professionally, super professionally trained actors. That's not what they did for a living generally, you know? Daisy was better than Harry, I think. Yes, uh, I agree. You're right. Coming out of nowhere. Coming out yeah. of nowhere to give these guys leads in a movie. Um, yeah, yeah, it was something they, they didn't, uh, in fact, they wouldn't, I don't think they did the freak show circuit. I think they were with the circus. So they were, you yeah. know, of course, accentuated for their height, uh, right, you know, riding around in little ponies and stuff like that. And they were hired by, yeah, they were with Ringling Brothers and Barnum Bailey, but I, they never went the route of the sideshow as far as I know. Uh, they didn't, it was, that's another interesting thing about these people is that they would, you know, some people just wouldn't do it. You know, Robert Wadlow, we'll talk about him, the tall guy, you know, he was with the circus, but he would not go to a sideshow. He was a, a man who was looked at because of his height, took advantage of that uh-huh. and made a career out of it, but wouldn't go the freak route. And sure. I think the dolls were like that too. Yeah, I can see that. 
Daisy Earls passed away on March 15th, 1980, uh, 72, and uh, Harry Earls, or Dahl, passed away on May 4th, 1985, uh, five years later, and he was 83. And I don't have causes of death. Yeah. they Well, I mean, natural causes, I'm sure, was nothing. I know that uh, Tiny Dahl, it was the last of them, died in 2004. Um mm. But, uh, yeah, and they're all cremated, except for uh, Gracie, who's supposedly in that cemetery. But, uh, you know, we had no luck. But it was a, yeah. it was like finding a needle in a haystack there. <laughs> but, yeah, they lived in a little home, all four of them together in the house. And they all died in that house in Sarasota. And um, sweet, sweet. My little friend, I told you my friend Sadie, she was four foot two. Uh, but she would do, again, she would do nothing. She'll do a lot of, you know, she'll go in animal costumes, uh, but she'll never do a circus. And that, that was just their, right. their kind of thing. Um, yeah. As opposed to dwarves, because dwarves are, are a whole different, a whole different thing. Because I, I saw Willy Wonka this week. I, it was the 50th anniversary. So I went to the movies to see mm-hmm. it. And oh, cool. I thought it was going to be this like amazing digital print. It wasn't. It was a nice print, but it was, you know, obviously it was not uh, remastered visually. Right. But it was interesting to see the Oompa Loompas on the big screen again. Uh, and the famous dwarves, Hervé Villachet, of course, um, yep. uh, Tattoo, uh, Vern Troyer, uh, Tony Cox, who's still alive. I saw him in my CVS lately, the guy that the, the black guy in um, in uh, Bad Santa. And, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Kenny Baker, Billy Barty, David Rappaport, Zelda Rubenstein from Poltergeist, Peter Dinklage mm-hmm. uh, from uh, uh, Elf. We talked about it in the uh, in the other yeah. uh, podcast. Um, Johnny Eck. Johnny Eck, the half man. Who had the half man? He had no no lower mm-hmm. half from the waist down, basically. And, there he is. And, um, uh, and I That's thought this him. was interesting. Apparently, uh, DiCaprio has been wanting to do a film about his life since the 90s uh and there's a screenplay written by the screenwriter who wrote edward scissorhands uh and supposedly the screenplay is amazing and but i mean trying for probably you know 30 years now almost to to get a film made um and for whatever reason hasn't happened yet but if uh, that would that would be really fascinating yeah he was an interesting man um yeah, I didn't realize he had a twin brother. I didn't know that until recently. They were, they were, uh, and they would do that magic act where they would, you know, uh-huh. saw somebody in half and then Johnny would get yes. out and run around. You know, there's a few <laughs> people that have been doing that. Have you seen them recent on YouTube? Those pranks where there's a, a couple of other people that do that on the beach, on Venice Beach. I you know, haven't. Have, <laughs> no. Oh my God. It's, but, it's hilarious to, <laughs> but I, I mean, I read that like people would go run screaming from the tent or wherever it was they were doing that, that performance act. Cause it was a saw and half act. And, yeah. and the brother would be the legs. And, you know, Harry Eck, of course, would be the top half and they would start chasing after his legs basically and people would run screaming from from the building uh men would yeah. abandon women like <laughs> just run yeah. for their lives <laughs> yeah, yeah look them up on youtube there's a couple of prank videos like that where somebody does that on venice beach and it is terrifying because you think somebody's literally cut in half and i need run because right. he could run faster on his feet on his hands than most people can on their feet and he would just run after people <laughs> it was just oh my god you'd lose your mind but yeah. apparently he had um he had he had legs apparently and we had him like tucked up. He didn't want his legs. You know, he didn't, I mean, they were probably not very big, but he apparently did have legs and these, and, uh, and, uh, somehow huh. tucked into his clothing. At least that's what in one of the documentaries I saw, uh, mentions that. And, hmm. uh, but they were, uh, yeah, he was born to fraternal twins and that and he lived and died in the same house, born and died in the same house. He could run, uh-huh. he could do, um, tightrope. He could, his trick was like going up on, down on the ladder. And, right. uh, and there's Which that famous the picture of him on a, him on a bicycle, a double bike. And Johnny, you know, the half man is on one side and then the other guy who has no arms is, is pedaling and Johnny's steering. <laughs> it's a great picture. Wow. wow. But, uh, yeah, he was, now, it's interesting because I literally just found this guy. His name was Jeffrey Pratt Gordon. And I saw he did a little interview about Johnny Eck on YouTube. So I reached out on Facebook and, and, and we've been corresponding. And I asked him about the house. He, he bought Johnny Eck's house 
and he's like a Johnny Eck historian. There's Johnny Eck. I think Johnny Eck museum.com is what it's called his website. And he sells like Johnny Eck t-shirts and, and stuff like that. But he bought the house that, uh, he says the house was built in 1896. The Eckhart was there. Eckhart, uh, he shortened it to Eck. Uh, they bought it in 1906. John senior, Amelia, their mother and their older sister, Carolyn, both parents died in the home in 39, a month apart from each other. They were set up for viewing in the living room parlor. That's the, the name parlor for funeral homes. And, uh, and he says, uh, yeah, I still own the house. He and his brother were born in the second floor on August 27th, 1911. Johnny died directly below that room on January 5th, 1991. His brother passed away in 95 at, uh, at church home hospital and, uh, was the only, this was their only home they ever knew. That's kind of neat wow. that somebody who had a real respect and uh, uh, an honor for these for Johnny Eck because he, he was a, mm-hmm. an accomplished. He could act. He's good looking guy. He uh, yeah. he was he would paint. And, you know, there's a thing in I think it's a Baltimore thing where they um, paint on screens. And there, you could see hmm. some Johnny, Johnny Eck's artwork on this uh, on this website. It's uh, he's an wow. interesting man. Very interesting man and a very kind man. I've, I've heard only nice things about him. We had, you know, another really fascinating story with the Siamese twins, Violet and Daisy Hilton. You know, the term Siamese twins came, come from the original ones that were Chang and Ang Bunker and who were the, mm. you know, they were born in, in what was then, uh, Siam and then it now is Thailand. But they're the ones that very famously, you know, fathered 21 children and they were the original Siamese twins. And that just became the term for co-joined twins. So Violet and Daisy Hilton were actually yeah, born in Britain and sold and exploited. And, uh, and they actually escaped their manager. I guess this woman at bottom was really nasty, beat them and put them on display. And then when she died, someone else inherited these two girls and, uh, and the same abuse. So somehow they came to America. Somehow they got to an attorney and he, she's, you gotta help us. You gotta get us out of here. And, uh, and this guy did and freed them from, uh, from their, their, uh, they're, you know, abusive guardians, legal. They were purchased, you know, it's so sad, but they were both, they had a combined weight of 166 pounds, the Hilton sisters. They stood four mm-hmm. foot nine and they, you know, they toured with, uh, Bob Hope and, uh, really? you know, he, they, yeah, yeah, they were legit. I mean, they're beautiful, you know, to, 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 to know them, if they were standing next to each other, they had an odd little angle. But no one knew there. A lot of people didn't even know they were connected. They would walk very smoothly, get in and out of cars real easy, you know. So they, but they had to have their dresses specially made or modified because they had to be connected. And they were connected by, um, let's see, their lower spines and hips were fused. They had the same blood circulation and, uh, and the same with the bunkers. And, uh, there was a movie they did on their own after Freaks called, um, change for life about this love affair that they were having and how they would, uh, their, their respective partners. And, sure. and, uh, and I think one was, but they, they, they represented that one would kiss and the other one would feel it. So it was, it was mm-hmm. just, I don't know. I don't think that was true. I don't think it really happened that way, but, right. uh, they, they, they retired. They moved to Charlotte, North Carolina and they worked in a supermarket together and violet or daisy would run the cash register and the sister who was sitting next to her obviously because they were connected right. would you know like weigh the produce or something and, and the people that worked huh. in the supermarket you know, that went there didn't didn't even know they were like siamese twins and they lived in a little oh, house and uh yeah it is it is interesting they were they were uh bad. It's like, imagine imagine not spending a minute by yourself you know connected from yeah birth and never having a moment to yourself. Uh, there was another pair of, uh, of twins, Ronnie and Donnie Galleon, who would, you know, brothers that were just, they'd beat the shit out of each other, you know, and they were connected. <laughs> they couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, you know, just a whole life of compromises is what they'd have to, t- you know, just their entire life is a compromise. Yeah. It's uh fascinating, but, uh, 
Yeah. So they were, they had a colorful life and they ended up, you know, being out of the picture completely. Didn't want to do any of that stuff anymore. I think they did show freaks once at their home, uh, uh in Charlotte or that, uh, mm. I don't know if they went to it or they asked them to go. I don't know if they ever did show up on it, but they passed away, um, in an interesting way. You probably, uh, have that. Do you? Cause I, I, I don't, don't. Have the date. I think, well, one of them died. They had influenza, pneumonia. They died of pneumonia. And they say one of them died and it was several hours later before the other one died, which has got to be just terrifying. Well, that's what happened to the bunkers, you know, the, the, the original Siamese twins. You know, they, they, they had different lives and they could, I think it was Houdini taught them, or was that the Hilton sisters taught them how to separate their brains you know, from the other one, how they could put huh. themselves in some sort of trance to, to dismiss the other one completely. Oh, so when they want to, you know, have marital relations and stuff, because what they would like the, the bunkers, they were both married. So they would spend a week at this house and then spend a week at that house. So they could all have their wow. own, you know, their own deal. And, uh, but he was again, Chang and Ang, um, one of them became a heavy drinker. And the other one was it. Oh. One of them had a stroke and one of their legs was paralyzed. Imagine being connected and then having a, 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 you know, a, a leg that didn't work anymore. And, um, they contracted bronchitis and one of them, uh, they were sitting because they want to sleep because they had congestion issues. So they, they slept in a chair in front of the fire and one of them died. And the, and so, you know, they found him and the other one says, well, I'm going to, it was like two hours later, he right. died too. But they, I wow. think they could have been fairly simple operations to, to nowadays to separate them, but they didn't want to yeah. do it. You know, that's what they knew. Yeah. And the, the Hiltons were that way too. The Hilton sisters, they just didn't want to do it. And, uh, sure. and you, have you seen, um, they're called the Chappelle sisters, Lori and Dory Chappelle. Uh, they're connected no. by the head and they showed up on Maury and they showed up on Jerry Springer. I think I've seen that before. Yeah. And one of them has spina bifida and, you know, is like on a tray and the other one can, can, you know, move pretty well on her own. And, uh, and then Dory, who was the one on the tray, um, became country singer called and changed her name to Reba. So Ugh. touring on a tray with her sisters hauling her around the whole time as this country singer called Reba. And now identifies as a male. It goes by George. So huh. so and also Lori, the other one, is a trophy winning bowler, which is something that I find fascinating. What? But um <laughs> by Chang and Ang Bunker, by the way, when they died, um they have they still have family reunions of all their ancestors, of all their uh, descendants. And there's, oh, and oh. the last one was in 2006, 1,500 descendants of Chang and Ang Bunker in, in Airy, Mount Airy, North Carolina. Mount, yeah, Mount Airy. So, um, and that interesting. Wow, that's wild. And then just, I got on a deep dive for a moment about twins. And <laughs> yeah, all these other people were twins. You know, Nelson, Ricky Nelson's kids. Jerry Hall, Linda Hamilton, Mary Lou Henner, yep. Scarlett Johansson, Corey Kennedy, Liberace had a twin that died as an infant. Elvis had a twin that died as an infant. The Olsen twins and um, Aaron Murphy and Diane Murphy, who was Tabitha on Bewitched. All these people had twin. And B. Davis was a twin. Isn't that interesting? And, you know, the maid on the Brady Bunch, Alice. Sure, sure. Um, also, but, uh, uh, Ashton Kutcher. Oh, really? I didn't know mm -hmm. that. It's interesting. Giovanni Ribisi, yep. too, is another one. But it's uh, fascinating. Oh, yeah. 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 And some of them, you know, it's known because like the like with the um, the Olsen twins that, you know, we always knew they were twins because they worked as child actors and and Hollywood productions like working with child actors who have twins because of labor laws um, and you know, limits mm -hmm. with how many hours a day they're allowed to work. So if you have twins, you can just rotate them in and out um, without yeah. you know, overworking any one twin. So. It's interesting when they when it, a celebrity becomes famous not as a child actor, so you don't know that they have a twin because <laughs> you know they became famous right. later in life. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very interesting, and I know that sometimes like one changes appearance quite drastically, and they have right. to you know stick with one. Because I know that was the way with the with the Tabithas on Bewitched, Aaron and Diane Murphy, and uh, and they then it just went down to uh, you know Aaron Murphy as the uh, Tabitha for 
the rest of it. You know, it was just the way, the way things ended up. But uh, anyway, so yeah, famous twins, the co-joined twins, Violet Daisy Chang and Ang. So, um, how about let's dip in? This is this is this is like epic. This thing is a really long podcast. Uh, Robert <laughs> Wadlow was another one. He wasn't in Freaks, but he was a very famous man. He was the tallest man in the world, uh, eight foot eleven. How at tall? Twenty two. Eight foot eleven. Jesus. And he w- he didn't stop growing. He w- there was no right. sign of him stopping. Uh, and uh, I forget what it what they what they, what they um, he had an infection or something. Well, actually, no, I know how he died. He was traveling with a shoe company. And he was like, a, mm-hmm. he was like, he would show up at shoe stores and open them or whatever. Because he was like a, a size promotion. twenty something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and he had a, um, by all accounts, a really nice guy. We we were when I'm, Jordan and I went on that trip recently. We stopped in Alton, Illinois, to go to his museum, which was closed because of COVID. But uh, we went to his grave and went to his house and all that stuff, and that was pretty cool. But he was in Manistee, Michigan, doing a shoe store in a um, shoe store promotion that they had yeah. hired him to do. And he uh, wore ankle braces because he was so big, he needed the support. And yeah. uh, one became irritated oh. and infected. That's right. And they couldn't take him to the hospital because they couldn't accommodate him. So they stayed in the hotel room for like 10 days, put two or three beds together uh, so he could be comfortable. But he ended up uh, passing away there. In uh, in Michigan, in Manistee, wow. Michigan, and shipped back to Illinois, 12 pallbearers and eight assistants. They said the coffin was uh, 10 foot by 9 wow. foot and weighed over 1,000 pounds. Crazy. But Robert Wadlow is one of those famous attractions. If you go to Ripley's, believe it or not, there's almost always a Robert Wadlow statue on the outside sure. of it, uh, uh, which is which is neat. But I, I did a lot of research. I love Robert Wadlow on him, and I'm going to be doing something about that. We got into a school, and uh, it was neat. It was neat That's to go cool. there. I liked him a lot. It was neat. But um, we can. Um, there's a couple of ones that you know they don't have much of a history to them, as so much as. Uh, don't know much about him. I mean, the Prince Randian was a fascinating one to look at. We mentioned him earlier, who was armless and legless and uh, would wear like this wool kind of garment around him. It just looked like a potato sack, really. <laughs> and uh, and he could his his talent was he could roll cigarettes with his mouth only and he could shave himself, too. Uh, so that's what huh. he would do for his uh, his entertainment portion of. uh of the sideshow for his little feature. And he was actually born in Guyana, spoke five languages, fathered five children that I'm really curious about. And, um, he had, it was called Tetramelia where he was born without limbs, but, um, yeah. And he died, um, December 19th, 1934, New Jersey was 63 years old, a spontaneous rupture of the heart. And, uh, my a heart attack, basically. Yeah. Then up to the Tomanis, Jeannie and Al Tomani. We mentioned them a little while ago. They're the ones that started Gibsonton, where all these lovely, wonderful sure. people uh, were were able to uh, to uh, live and and not be bothered by others, and opened up their giant fishing camp. They adopted two kids. He was eight foot four. She was. Uh, uh, he was worth twenty six shoe. Huh. And uh, and opened up their little restaurant, and Jeannie Tomani stayed there until she passed away. Uh, and uh, and their their old giants camp, it's they've kept one of the cottages, and there is a statue of Al Tomani's boot in front of it. But it's huh. like on a busy road, and if you literally, if you don't look, you wouldn't you wouldn't see it. And it's it's sad because these people were important at that uh for for the whole town and for the community and she said she she said you know people always looked at this oddly because she was the half girl of course they were going to look at her oddly she goes when i was young i had a ball she said i i love the attention and uh Mm -hmm. so taking these you know lemons and making lemonade as it were sure they were the world's strangest married couple and uh and um yeah and they're and they're forever in Gibson too, too. They're buried in the same cemetery, although a little bit further from each other. But uh, yeah, 
Sad, sad, but lovely, lovely people from all accounts. And then uh, I'll just do a uh, a little brief thing on Grady Styles. I did a YouTube video about him and his murder. They called him the lo- Lobster Boy. He yeah. was uh, ectrodactyly was what I think it was called. Where he, he was born with it, with his fingers fused together and his arms, mm-hmm. and and he came from a family that did that on purpose to be in the sideshow. You know, like they Crazy. purposely made more lobster babies so they could carry on this family tradition. There was a book that was really big in the 90s called Geek Love. And it was about that sort of that was one of the main parts is this family that were creating their own, uh, uh, quote unquote freaks so to continue that family tradition. It, um, it's fascinating. It, it's, it's fascinating. And Grady Styles wow. was a nasty drunk mean drunk would beat people strangle people had butt people and his wife basically took a contract out on him it's it's a fat it's a fascinating story yeah um because he had a lobster child and a lobster two lobster children and then um but the woman the mother who's beaten the wife who married him twice was married to him for a second time who and her her son from a different relationship the human blockhead who would pound nails into his head uh she told her son i got to get out of this relationship so blockhead hired another guy to kill him and uh and did for like fifteen hundred dollars and uh it, it, they you know it was done in a minute they they rolled in a minute when the police are doing the investigations but mm. uh yeah it's, it's a fascinating story grady styles and it, it's yeah. on my youtube channel if you wanted to uh to to find out more about it just uh and Grady Styles the third, he's still around. Remember, for a while there was that freak show in Venice. Uh, it just closed like three years ago, and they had Grady Styles the third there, and it was it was mostly geeks, you know, and people shoving nails into their faces and swallowing mm-hmm. sword swallowers, and there were very few, I think, uh, uh, pr- you know, proper what they would call physical sideshow attractions, and. Um, and uh yeah but that was that was a freak show a lot of little people and and grady the third i don't know where he is anymore but he's still around i guess he's active on facebook i I haven't looked huh there's just one other point i wanted to make is that um modern day freak shows they think it's on pc and they would never let it happen now but have you turned on tlc (laughs) (laughs) the learning the learning channel it's my 600 pound life it's the right. world's fattest people. It's the hoarders. It's the little families. And it is like the, you know, they're, they're going under the, under the umbrella of it being the learning channel and almost being <laughs> educational, but they are right. just doing the freak shows, you know, and, and it's under a different guys but i just found that i found that interesting it still exists and they're masking it as this educational television but uh it's really exploitation in its own way yeah but uh so we wanted to talk about todd browning and what you read something uh yeah so i had a couple of guys I i wanted to talk about todd robbins who was the author who wrote um the short story spurs that freaks was based on so when mm-hmm. Browning wanted to make Freaks, he optioned the rights or bought the rights to the Spurs short story. Uh, and Spurs was based actually in France and when a French uh, traveling carnival or circus. And most of the story, of course, <laughs> was thrown out. Uh, very little of it survived uh, into the screenplay. I think the um, the big dinner scene um, was the main thing. that, And I think one other scene were the two main things that stayed. And I believe the overall, um, the kind of plot of of the scheming trapeze artist, you know, trying to get the the guy's money. I think that was taken from that, you know, the short story, but I think everything else of course was changed. And of course it was moved from France to the U S um, the, the, the setting, but Todd Robbins was an interesting guy. He was born into a wealthy family, uh, in the Northeast U S and, um, he, so this is you know, the really, author. Yes. The author of the short okay. story, Todd, okay. oh, sorry, Todd, sorry. So Todd Robbins had an interesting life. He was born into wealth. He was born, in, you know, uh, in, up in the Northeast, and his dad died when he was fairly, uh, I think, still a young man. Robbins was so he inherited, you know, so much wealth at that age that he really didn't need to work anymore. Um, and he became an author, and he eventually immigrated to the French Riviera, and was there when World War II started. And he had every opportunity to leave. He could have gone back to the UK or he could have even gone back to the US to kind of write out the, mm-hmm. the war. Um, but he was kind of like defiant and he refused to leave France. So he ended up uh, being sent to a concentration camp that was in France 
um, you know, by wow. the Germans when they invaded. And it was not um, not that there were any good concentration camps. It was not like a death camp or something horrible like that. But it was where um, a lot of the, um, you know, uh, Americans and Brits that were caught, you know, civilians that were, you know, became mm. part of occupied, you know, France is where they were sent. Um, and so he, he went through that experience and they don't, they don't know which camp he was in. Uh, he never wrote about it. Um, but he was, but they've kind of guessed at which one he probably was sent to. And then, uh, and then he eventually, you know, he survived and he got through the war and he passed away there in the French Riviera, uh, in 1949 on May 10th and he was 60 years old. But hmm. he had a crazy, he had a crazy, one crazy story that I really liked was he was, um, when he was in college in America, they went to some, he and some buddies went out for a night out and they ended up in some theater. Uh, and it was, uh, there was a boxing event going on and there was this Frenchman in the ring who was touting himself as like the, the champion boxer of France. And he, he, they had an, they had a fight and the guy won. And then they, they challenged anybody in the, in the audience that wanted to fight this guy. If they won, they would be crowned, you know, the boxing champion of France. They would become the new guy. Mm -hmm. And so Todd Robbins' friends goaded him into doing it. And I guess he was a pretty athletic guy. And when he got in the ring, <laughs> the French fighter looked at him and was like, no, <laughs> and, and left. And so he, te so he unofficially by default, Todd Robbins became the, you know, the unofficial, uh, so-called, uh, you know, uh, champion boxer of France, um, How by, interesting. just by getting in the ring. And it turned out that this, this boxer was actually, this Frenchman was actually just an actor and he was just trying to get money to go home. <laughs> so it was all, you know, wow. all set up, but yeah, it was really a fascinating story. So he, he uh, probably Spurs, uh, that was the freaks was based on. It's probably the biggest most famous work he did right i mean yeah he had, he had other um he was published if you know he had a few other books published i believe full-length novels and stuff but yeah i think spurs is probably what he's most best known for because todd browning you know took on yeah and i thought it was interesting since todd browning himself had a history with you know carnivals and and circuses working with them that he would take on this film and it's almost like he was the right person to tell the story because he showed all these performers as real human beings and showed them with some compassion um, which yeah. uh, another director that didn't have that background might not have done or probably wouldn't have done. Um, so it's almost like, you know, it's like the, the, today they would call that representation, you know, representation matters. Uh, having this director that, that pro you know, I'm sure had befriended uh, performers like this when he worked uh, in, in that circuit himself uh, had a much more sympathetic eye towards those characters than someone else might have had, I think. Um but Todd Browning, uh, he made his, uh, became a famous director in the silent era and was most famous because he did 10 films with Lon Chaney. And when he uh, went on to make Dracula in 1931, uh, he wanted Chaney, but Chaney died. And so he got, as he kind of put it, he kind of got stuck with Bela Lugosi. It was not his first choice. But of course, Bela Lugosi, you know, made the role famous. And, yeah. and Todd yeah. Browning's Dracula with Bela Lugosi is a major, major milestone in the history of horror. Uh, film production and then kicked off, as we said earlier, Universal's whole monster movie horror run in the 1930s. It's so famous. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he had also, uh, Browning had also previously done another film, a silent film about circus, uh, carnival performers, uh, that he made in 1927 called The Show. So it wasn't even the first time he'd done this subject matter before. But here's the interesting story that I really wanted to tell. So, in um, 1915, Todd Browning was not yet a famous established director yet. Uh, he was just kind of in the early stages of his career. And he was driving at night with uh, two other people, uh, both in showbiz. And one of them was Elmer Booth, who at that time had some fame as a silent film actor. And there's two versions of events. One is that Browning was driving drunk and the other one was that it was foggy and visibility was bad. Um, it may have been a combination of the two, but he, he ran into a, a train, into like a, a flat car on a train, and it was carrying rails, and it was, you know, it ki instantly killed Elmer Booth, uh, from, you know, severe head trauma from running into this, wow. these rails. And, uh, and, um, Todd Browning and the other passenger were seriously, seriously injured, uh, broken bones, lacerations to their face. And it, it apparently took him quite a long time, quite a few months, uh, to recover from this accident. So here's where it gets interesting. 
I, I went back and read the original stories. You know, in the old stories, they would actually print the people's addresses in the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And the address that they gave for Todd Browning was 4500 Sunset Boulevard, which was where D.W. Griffith's studio was based at that time. And D.W. Griffith was getting ready to make Intolerance, his big epic, and Elmer Booth was actually slated he was going to get a role in, in that film. And um, Browning was ended up working as an assistant director on Intolerance. He was one of the many assistant directors they had working on it because it was such a huge production. So Elmer Booth dies, and D.W. Griffith feels bad for Booth's family, and Elmer Booth had a younger sister named Margaret Booth. And D.W. Griffith hired her as what they then used to call cutters, which were now called film editors. And a cutter, literally, because they would take scissors and, and razor blades to physically cut the film uh, to edit it all together. So Margaret Booth gets hired almost kind of out of sympathy for her family by D.W. Griffith because, you know, they lost their breadwinner in Elmer Booth when her brother died. So Margaret Booth starts working as a cutter. So fast forward to 1932 and Freaks has been made, and as we talked about earlier, uh, Irving Thalberg took the movie away from Browning and chopped almost a third of it off. Yeah, yeah. And guess who was the supervising editor at MGM by this point? Margaret Booth. So it was her? No kidding. Yep. Margaret Booth was the supervising editor at MGM and she was made supervising editor in 1932. She'd been an editor there for several years. She had become f- good friends with Irving Thalberg. In fact, Irving Thalberg, as the legend goes, coined the term film editor. It never existed before and bestowed it upon Margaret Booth. She was the, supposedly, as legend goes, the first person to be given the film editor title uh, in the 20s. And so she'd been an editor at MGM for years by this point. Gets made the supervising editor, and she never forgave Todd Browning for the death of her brother. And Irving Thalberg and MGM takes his movie away from him and edits the hell out of it and cuts it. And I don't know if she ever had anything to do with Freak. She's not credited on it. But they also said that when she became supervising editor for the next 30 years, there wasn't a project that came out of MGM that she didn't have oversight over as an editor. Wow. That's so a great story. It's interesting whether or not, uh, you know, if she had anything to do with it getting chopped down over this, you know, and, and she had no love for the guy, obviously, because he, he blamed yeah. him for the death of her brother. So I don't know. And she ended up having one of the most prolific careers. She's a very, very famous editor in film history, not just because she's, you know, supposedly the first person to get the title, but she had a 70 year career in post production in Hollywood. She edited Annie in 1982. She was in her 80s. That's how long her career went. Uh, She also edited The Goodbye Girl. She edited Mutiny on the Bounty back in the 30s. I mean, she was in the middle of it. What a, what a life. And, 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 yeah. and, and it's part happened because her brother died and she got offered that job. Uh, and at that time in the early years, most of the cutters were women. Most of the film editors were female, um, in those mm-hmm. early years. Really? So, I didn't know that. And there wow, was an American a story. and in one of the seasons of American horror story, there was a character named Margaret Booth, which I assume maybe is connected it must be in freak some show. way. It wasn't based on it her in any way. Show. I don't think the character was like her, but it was she was named Margaret Booth. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to look that up because that's symbolic of something. Mm-hmm. You know? It's got to be. So maybe it is the freak show season. I wonder Maybe. I wonder. Huh. Um and then uh of course there's a six degrees of Manson connection. Because there always is. Uh yeah. One of her early film credits was in uh, 1923. It was a film called The Wanters. Uh, and this is a year before MGM got formed, but it was for Louis B. Mayer, his original production company, and uh, which also featured Norma Shearer, who was Irving Thalberg's, who went on to be Irving Thalberg's wife uh, and the queen of MGM in the 30s. Um, and uh, the writer of The Wanters was Paul Byrne. Oh my gosh. Okay. Who, <laughs> and of okay. course, Paul Byrne, you know, built the house that eventually, uh, Jay Sebring lived in when, at the time of the murders of the Manson murders, when he yeah. became, when he was killed. That's good. That's good. It's like one of the six degrees. Like, <laughs> we got to do this. We got to figure it out. You did it, man. That's, that's really good. <laughs> There's got to be a reference in there somewhere. <laughs> there has to be, man. I know some people get annoyed that was by it. Very, very good. 
<laughs> yeah, I didn't know that um, until I was reading a little bit about it that that he's an uncredited. Todd Browning was an uncredited writer on um, Intolerance, the D.W. Griffith movie. Which oh, interesting. I didn't know. That's interesting. And um, they, I, it's kind of newsy now because um, you know, Intolerance was the largest movie shot ever. If you look it up, it's insane the amount of extras that were in this thing. And Int- Intolerance is a, I thought it was kind of a right. hard movie to sit through, but yeah. uh, 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 but it's a silent movie and epic, huge uh, sets that uh, were actually they yeah. say one of the first tourist attractions in Hollywood. People came yeah, in to see the set. Yeah, because they didn't tear them down. Yeah, and it was right. So we was talked right about the Vista, Vista Theater. We talked about the Vista yeah. Theater earlier, and that's where basically the set was kind of in that block of streets there, yeah. which was right next to where D.W. Griffith Studios were. Uh, and they remained yeah, standing can, for years and years. Of, um, a set, there's a picture of the set being built, and you can still match up the houses that are still there. It's it's all yeah. still there. So um, Margaret Booth died in 2002 at a, the age of 104. She lived in three different <laughs> centuries. No kid. Wow. She was born in 1898, so she lived in the 1800s, the 1900s, and the 2000s. <laughs> Is that crazy? Um, That's fascinating. And then, and then you know, Todd Browning, uh, his career kind of faded uh, throughout the, over the 30s. He did some more films, but by 1939, uh, reportedly, he felt like you know the industry had kind of passed him on. The sensibilities of of the audiences had changed from the types of films that he made, and so he basically virtually retired or in, by the end of the 1930s. Uh, and then he went in; he became a recluse. He had a home in Malibu, and he just disappeared into the home. And uh, his wife died in 1944, and he had been become he'd become such a recluse by then that apparently uh, that one of the big obituaries reported that he had died. Um, that not not his wife. Hmm. There was confusion, um, and then he you know he kind of lived an alcoholic, uh, reclusive lifestyle and and died himself on October 6, 1962, um, and the cause was unknown. But he had been treated for cancer. Uh, over the, those last few years of his life. And then, of course, he had years of alcohol abuse. So, I know that um, he had uh, – oh, there was a story. Did you ha- did you see read that story about the guy showing up at uh, at his grave, at his funeral, with a case of Coors beer? I don't know where no. I got that. Oh, I can't really get it find it. That. But, uh, yeah, here's the story I got. It was uh, – he was he was embalmed by Gates, Kingsley Gates. They're the people who um, – they're in Santa Monica still. After visiting hours, a gentleman only known as Lucky sat with Browning's corpse and polished off a case of Coors beer. (laughs) He knew nothing of Browning's life, Hollywood life, but the two were drinking buddies and the pact was Uh, made while Todd was still alive. So um, uh, that's that's an interesting story. (laughs) There was a thing about Todd Browning had a parrot and the only thing it knew how to say was, where's Dorothy? (laughs) (laughs) What? Okay. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, and I forget who um, he was with because he kind of he chummed up with a bunch of people, but he's buried in this little place with his wife Alice and these other people called Houghton H O U G H T O N in a little columbarium, the most unassuming little <laughs> place. Um, his, yeah, his wife was probably like, "Who the hell is Dorothy?" <laughs> yeah, why is the parent yeah. saying some other woman's name? <laughs> Who is this? Lady? Big Wizard of Oz fans here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that must be it. That must be it. Um, but um, I think so. Did we do freaks? So, yeah, I think it's, I think we're done with freaks. Um, I, I wanted to are. give a. I wanted to give a quick shout out. We talked earlier about, you know, you mentioned some documentaries, uh, related to some of these, uh, characters. And that reminded me that, um, you know, our mutual acquaintance, uh, friend Jeffrey Schwartz, uh, he's a documentary filmmaker. He did, uh, Divine, the Divine documentary and Tab Hunter Confidential and Alan Carr, really, really good showbiz docs. Um, mm-hmm. and he has a new yeah. one coming out called Boulevard, a Hollywood story that's all about how, uh, Gloria Swanson tried to get, uh, a, a, a Sunset Boulevard musical off the ground. Um, and we, you know, she was trying to do it herself. Um, and In I just, a story, I, yeah. And it's amazing. It's a story I knew nothing about. And, uh, apparently I, I, um, I, my IMDb, it popped up. I got a special thanks credit for it, which is really nice. Nice. Uh, <laughs> That's cool. I know. I do. That's I don't know. Cool. I don't remember what I did, but I'm, a, I appreciate it always. Uh, and I'm freaking fascinated by this story, just reading about it. And, um, it apparently premiered at Outfest, uh, this past, this month. 
and uh, hopefully we'll be out, you know, for people to watch and rent soon. I don't know what the release plan for it is, but I'm sure yeah. it'll get distribution and, you know, be out in the next few months, hopefully. So it is fascinating. I mean, Gloria Swanson was a smart lady and she bought the rights to a musical version of Sunset Boulevard in the 60s. She was going to get this thing off the ground. I think she may even got the rights in the 50s, mm-hmm. but, uh, but she was working with these guys. She got the permission from Paramount Studios to do this. And then Paramount started backing off on it and they started saying, well, you know, we can't, we don't want it to, uh, uh, take away from the actual movie itself. Sure. And, and they really jerked her around because she spent a lot of money on it. She hired uh, these two guys that were composing the music and, uh, and Paramount really jerked her around on it. I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, I'm looking forward to this documentary. Uh, because she ended up, you know, it's probably one of the biggest disappointments of her life, if there was one, was that this thing didn't get off the ground. Because it was a real passion right. project for her. So I, I'm excited to see it. I guess Andrew Lloyd Webber got one off the ground in the 90s, but that's not the same. It wasn't the same project that she was associated Correct, with. Correct, yeah. I think, yeah. Um, before yeah. we wrap, well, for people watching the video version, what is the big banner behind you, by the way, that we've referenced a couple <laughs> times? <laughs> This was, uh, I had this made actually, uh, oh, so okay. I had a custom done for me and, uh, it was, there's Grady, oh, let's take this down. <laughs> but, uh, okay. yeah, I had this done. I don't know. It was the last time I got an income tax refund. So it had to have been in the <laughs> early two thousands. <laughs> and, uh, and this is what I, this is what I spent the money on. So it's genuine. Like it's a tar, it's done, you know, it's like a real proper tarp sure. canvas and it's got the, the grommets that, that you hang it on. Johnny Act. These are my three favorites. And, uh, and thank you for asking about it, Mike, cause I'm putting this up on eBay. <laughs> cause are I got you? a place to, uh, <laughs> yeah. So after this thing, after this thing airs, this is my little commercial now. I'm putting this up on eBay. So, uh, okay. cause I can't use it anymore. And, uh, it's just too big. I got no space for it. And I love right. it. And I think it's heavy. It's heavy duty. So anyway, yeah, thanks for nice. asking. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> We're now like the the home shopping network suddenly. <laughs> no, yeah, really. And it can and be yours Ronco, for three Popeil. for three low low payments. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that was fun. No, it was exhausting. It was a lot of information about a lot of different people. And the video version is probably going to be, you know, a little bit more. We'll put the images up so people are going to know who we're talking about. You know, we sure. can throw pictures up there and of, of who these people were in the movie. And, yeah. uh, but they are all so interesting. They're all like the books are very special people. Right. And, uh, and I, and I agree. I agree that they were. And, uh, they're still, we're still talking about them. Yep. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks to everybody for listening. Thanks again to all of our Patreon supporters and uh, and everybody else that listens to our show. We appreciate everyone. And we have fun Very doing this. So. And, and, you know, during these times especially, I, I listen to podcasts. It's a nice escape. And hopefully, you know, we're, we're, we're doing the same. Oh, you know what? Somebody, Allison Martino texted me yesterday. There's a new documentary about that murder house in Los Feliz. Uh, oh, really? This woman put, yeah, it's like a seven- episode podcast about and for those who don't know there's this old house up in Los Feliz a neighborhood in LA up in the hills by by Griffith Park and this house has been sitting there empty for decades right and you look inside and all these old you know gift of Christmas gifts and things like that are still there from the 50s because the family that lived there the father killed the wife tried to kill the daughter with a hammer uh and uh and he ended up being he killed himself he drank cyanide and uh in this house and so this but it's always been kind of a strange story, but this woman actually did put it together. And apparently there was another death in that house. She was being vague about it. Of course, she wants people to watch huh. the, uh, yeah, the, the, it, the, it, the, the, the home, the home stayed vacant for decades and decades. Um, and I mean, yeah. you could even look in through the windows and see old Christmas decorations from, yeah. you know, from back then. It kind of was left untouched and I think kind of was used as storage basically by the estate over the years. Um, a friend of yeah, mine, cause it, a, it was inherited. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. They, I think, I think they're, that it was inherited by their landscaper or something. And then the <laughs> landscaper died and the son got it. And the son is the one who had it. Now he's dead. And that's why it went for sale again. It's yeah. called, um, Los Feliz Murder Mansion Podcast. And okay. the family, well, it's interesting now because you talk about the Christmas presents. The family was Perelson. They're Jews. So it's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, it's, there's a lot of confusion about that story. And this podcast yeah. is supposed to be, uh, addressing that. 
That's interesting. Uh, a friend of mine who's a producer I, uh, has, I believe, he has the the film rights to that ha- to the house and the story. Oh, nice! He's been, I think trying to get something going. So that's really. I, I'm almost positive it's the Los Feliz Murder House. Yeah. So that's really interesting. I'll th- I wonder if he knows yeah. that that podcast is coming up. Maybe something could happen. Who knows? Maybe. It'd be a good episode of American Horse. Oh, actually, the first one is that already uh, the Murder Mansion. <laughs> right. But um. But yeah. Well, thanks, freaks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, freak. Go- <laughs> Google, Google goggle. Is that uh, go- Google, Google gobble. gobble? One of us. We accept you. One of us. Yeah, we accept yeah. you. We accept you. So you're one of us listeners and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Take care. This has been an episode of the Dearly Departed podcast. Dig up more episodes at dearlydepartedpod.com and on iTunes and Google Play. See you next time. <laughs>